lot. You guys need to be. What I need is a third screen, actually. For... <laughs> well, you need VR, man. You can have virtual screens. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's that's essentially where you have those floating screens, which is something that's yeah. really cool. I actually absolutely love that stuff. Uh, now I need to see whether I am actually alive. Testing, testing. Yeah, it does seem like we're live. All right, cool, sweet. Hello, everyone. This is pre-stream. This is pre-stream. We are looking at some trailer roll of our wonderful, wonderful patron crew who have joined us in making the divided states a reality. We will start the stream in a couple of minutes. We are looking at. Episode 2, the Kaiserreich documentary, which focuses on the Commune of France. Do not adjust the settings on your computer machine. Episode 2 does release after episode 3. We'd like to um, keep it complex over here, what do you guys think? <laughs> it's, uh, it's, a, it's a throw off, you know, the uh, yeah, code breakers. Yeah. The, nice the throwing off the shackles of, uh, of serialized numbering. I think we'll do episode 7 next just to keep it really confusing. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Happy 4th of July to our... July to all our American cats. I've also... Or it, it could be like throwing really high numbers and then having to make things up just to get there. Like episode like 27 and then we have to come up with like 26 more ideas, you know? Yeah, I love that. Or, or you know, we can act. There actually, the, the number of the episode is actually never said within that video. So what we can do is we can just randomly start changing numbers. Yeah, okay, <laughs> <Be> like, <laughs> this is episode alpha omega. This is episode uh, twenty. Oh. Alpha oh, dash twelve. Yeah, it's gonna be awesome. We we'll just keep keep everyone guessing all the time. But yeah, episode uh, two is the documentary of Frog's episode. I am going to uh, put out some announcements now. So, add everyone on Discord, we are live with a premiere of the second episode of the Kaiser Live documentary. You love how clacky my keyboard is. It's right above my microphone, it's like, mmm, love it. I will not say... I'm not. I will not say the brand. Actually, it's a Corsair, but I'm not being paid by Corsair, so don't buy Corsair. Oh my or maybe god, Vince is being paid by Corsair! <laughs> <laughs> but if, if people from Corsair are like, you know, watching this, you know, I mean, you know, hit us up, man. Like, I love Corsair. <laughs> I've got like two or three of those <laughs> down here. Actually, I'm not super happy with this keyboard. Um, the, the letters do seem to wear out fairly quick and then they, they get sticky, which is weird. Oh, but the, wow. the, the support crew at Corsair have been cool. Like, every time I've sent them an email, I'm like, yeah, I need this, this, and this key. They just send you like a letter with the keys in it. But it's been... I think I've almost replaced every key on this keyboard by now. It's like weird. Vincent, this just in. I got a call from Corsair, and they heard what you said, and we're we're gone, dude. They talked, they heard the keys, and you know they hung up the phone right then. You know we were so close to getting. Yeah, we were so close, so close. Oh, than God, them, honestly, we're actually. Can I tear actually... up the contract right now? <laughs> we are actually talking uh, to a sponsor. Uh, just a minute, I need to test some audio. Right then, you know we were so close to getting. Yeah, we were so. Yeah, I am actually talking to a sponsor uh, right now. So we might you remember when I did that meme where we would never take a mobile game sponsorship. We may may come back on that one. Um, and that is because, you know, we need money. <laughs> we need running. money. Money <laughs> fuels everything. We are running out of money. We are desperate. Uh, and uh, my girlfriend is now the breadwinner of the house. So she pays all the bills. I make no money. Um, um, and she pure would matriarchy. To, yeah. Pure matriarchy. I gotta love it. Um, but yeah, we could really use some extra money for the divided states, of course, uh, as we've said before. Uh, looks like we have reached uh, 2330. Uh, see some interesting questions in chat. Uh, I will answer those. Uh, Miss Man Jones, for example, excuse me, I will answer those uh, while the video is playing and I am not on microphone, so you, get, so you guys don't hear the clickety clack of that keyboard all the way into the night. Let's see what we have here. I need to switch you guys to full cam. Nope, wrong one. Okay, correct one. Hello everyone, welcome to the Kaiser Cat Cinema live stream. Do not adjust the settings on your computer machine. You are not mistaken. This is the premiere live stream of the second episode of the Kaiser Reich documentary. I am here on voice chat with our crew and patrons. We have a couple of the regulars around here. Let's see who's, uh, who's in this channel. Marcus, AOS, Kaiser, Bismarck, King, Goethe, Minute Man. We have Neil Ferrandi from the French Rework team who is going to answer some questions for us after that. 
Old Man Davis, the oldest of the Kaiserreich developers, of course, and Otto von Yitzmark. We need to do a quick audio check. Okay, looks like that's all nice and crispy. I will switch you guys to a screen share, but bear with me because whenever I switch an OBS screen, I'm bound to click on like a weird thing. Uh, screen plus cam plus music. Yeah, this is it. This is it. Okay, so we will also be doing a poster giveaway through a prize question, which I have not figured out yet. Uh, Neil, if you are actually uh, listening, you're probably listening. Uh, can you come up with two prize questions real quick, uh, like concerning France, basically? Uh, we'll uh, need a little help with this one. But essentially, I finished two new posters for the webshop. There is a July 4th events uh, sale going on, 4 through 14 July. Finished these new designs, spent a lot of time working on them, had a lot of fun. Uh, this this one is selling really well, seems to be the Loyalist faction is very popular, which is great. And I am not going to talk too much in this intro because this is a long ass episode. This is a 40 minute episode, so we probably want to get on with the show real quick. Without further ado, the premiere of World of Kaiserreich documentary. Episode 2, Commune of France. I will mute myself during this and go to full screen. I hope you guys enjoy this wonderful documentary directed by our very own Marcus Jorgensen. Marcus, can you sound off? Ooh, hope you enjoy the episode. So, Work really hard in it, yeah. Wonderful work uh, on this episode, Marcus. I really love what you did with the footage. There's so much more footage in this episode than there was in the last one. And, you know, the colorization, the interpolation, all the extra work that's gone into it is really cool. So I need full screen, no music, no overlays. Looks like... Yes, uh, 37 minutes and 21 seconds to be exact. So not exactly 40 minutes, but okay, that's not, not too bad. Uh, I need to take off music. And I need my system audio to be on. Okay, I think this is it. All right, guys, enjoy the show. This is the world premiere of the second episode of the Kaiserreich documentary directed by Margus Jorgensen, edited by Marcus, assisted by me and written by us at Kaiserreich Cinema and the Kaiserreich French rework team. So uh, hottest and newest French lore. Enjoy. By ourselves. To fund our content, this video was sponsored by ourselves. To fund our content, we built a spin-off alt history flag designer called Flag Maker and Print. More about that after the video. Thank you for watching and enjoy the show, cats. Paris, 1919. The doors to the historic Hotel Ritz, located in the heart of the City of Lights, are wide open. People run in and out freely, soldiers mixing with girls on the street Red banners and bedsheets hung outside, printed with inverted red chevrons, hammers, and torches. A year ago, many were still fighting the German invaders in the fields of northern France, sent to die in desperate counter-offensives, untold numbers of men lost to the folly of war. Some, finally, had had enough, and began resisting the orders sent out by an out-of-touch high command. Repression was harsh, and ultimately, futile. When unrest among French workers grew, the bourgeois government sued for peace, the war was lost, and a humiliating peace was soaked in the blood of a sacrificed generation. The hated 1919 Versailles Treaty would be the herald of an age of revolution. The repressed labor and soldier classes of France had finally had enough. Strained by reparations and wartime debt, they rose up in a popular revolt to replace the rotten French Third Republic. Today, Paris is in the hands of those revolutionaries, signaling the start of an unstoppable tide of liberation. Here in the capital of France, where once the idea of monarchy was toppled, this spark of revolutionary fervor will light a signal fire to echo across borders, cultures, and horizons. Here. The torch and gear are lit for generations to come. The end of the war will not bring peace, but the seeds to another war. France will rise to challenge Germany again one day. There can be no doubt about it. There will be a second Weltkrieg.
It is often said that the French syndicalist revolution started in the streets of Paris. In truth, it began in the trenches. After nearly three years of unrelenting war and amid the worst conditions imaginable, the first cracks in France's wartime unity began to appear in 1917. In May that year, a series of small mutinies, miraculously undetected by the Germans, broke out along French lines. Tired of suicidal offensives, their morale cratered by repeated failures and mounting losses, the soldiers refuse offensive orders. Despite government attempts to suppress the news, trains full of coffins and stories return to the home front. France is losing the war. The once unquestionable morale of the French army now lies in doubt, and the idea of looming defeat sends shockwaves through the nation. Four months later, the Union Sacré, a political truce which has long united France's right and left wings, finally collapses. From the front lines to the home front, France is divided for the first time since the start of the war. Parliamentary control of the army is put into question, and the reigning government, led by the unpopular Paul Penlevé, is forced to resign. He is replaced by the fiery Georges Clemenceau, promising a way out of the war. The government can only do so much, however, as France sinks ever deeper into wartime debts, and another crushing blow for the morale of the Entente Allies is right around the corner. The year 1918 brings only bad news. Russia, a loyal ally of the Entente under the Tsar's government, already shaken by a democratic revolution in 1917, sees the Republican government of Alexander Kerensky toppled after a popular revolution by the Bolsheviks. These radical leftist groups gather to form a new People's Republic, colloquially referred to as Soviet Russia. While pockets of white resistance continue through the motherland, the Soviets move to sign a separate peace with the Central Powers. Strained and pushed to the brink of national collapse, Lenin's new Soviet government is forced to cede enormous amounts of Eastern Europe to the Kaiser and his allies. The news is met in Berlin with celebrations, and a crushing blow is dealt to the Entente. Soldiers at the Western Front shudder, because they know the Central Powers will be able to remobilize their enormous Eastern Front armies west, skewing the balance of power finally in favor of Germany and Austria. Some, however, are inspired by this revolutionary fervor. Perhaps an end to the war and a better world are right around the corner after all. Entente powers move to condemn the government of Soviet Russia as her revolutionary nature threatens the very foundation of the European apparatus of state. Germany knows it has inspired something dark and dangerous. But for now, the Kaiser is content claiming this victory and bringing all his armies to bear against the arrogant Western Entente. In France, crushing news of Russia's surrender is followed by the failure of General Foch's great Western offensive, which grinds to a halt by the end of June. France throws the full weight of the French army against German lines, setting the front ablaze from the Argonne Forest to the sea. A few weeks later, however, the French army has nothing to show beyond an ever-lengthening list of casualties. Minor territorial gains are made around Lille, but these come at the staggering cost of over 200,000 lives. Despite progress by British troops in the Middle East, News reaches France and Britain that Romania and Greece have collapsed, putting an end to the last remnants of Entente resistance in the East. Slowly, the formidable alliance crumbles as she is ground down by the Central Powers, bolstered by America's refusal to enter the war or allow Paris and London to accrue further debt. The government censors could not keep this truth from us. We had lost Romania. We had lost Dunkerque, we had lost Russia and Greece, and most of all, we had lost brothers, slaughtered by the hundreds of thousands, dead on the fields of Europe. For what? What could we ever have to gain from this Armageddon? What hope is left for France as the German hordes stand outside our gates? A second wave of mutinies begins on the heels of Fox Offensive larger than the first, and amid the war's first major labor strikes, calls for revolution are heard. 
In Paris and Lyon, production lines grind to a halt in armaments factories, and metro lines are blocked for a week. Logistical arteries vital to the war effort are disrupted. For a short while, it seems, the workers' voices must be heard, but once again the mutinies are suppressed and the strikes broken, their principal agitators labelled Soviet spies. Although Prime Minister Georges Clemenceau and his radical independent party are convinced that the war can still be won, the protests' continued suppression disguises a population increasingly pushed to the breaking point. By the end of the year, life on the home front becomes ever more difficult, as French cities are plagued with famine and lack of basic resources. Slowly, it becomes clear to broad swathes of French society that victory could come at a price too high to pay. The first anti-war protests, led by socialist forces, begin on December 8th. The government attempts a harsh crackdown, but it doesn't stop the protesters from widely distributing pacifist pamphlets, copies of La Vie Ouvrière specially written for the occasion. The wave of protests spreads to other French cities, and soon, even the front lines are contaminated by revolutionary pacifist slogans. Ami, ouvrière, brothers, why do we fight? Why do we die? What happens if we win? Will it bring bread to the table? Improve our lives? Shorten the workdays? We struggle and die in trenches. So we may struggle and die in factories, in victory. What has the elite promised us after the war? Not the nation, not France. What have the elite said they will do for us? I hear silence. That is because they have led us to war with vague promises and blag. Servir la patrie est une moitié du de devoir. To serve the homeland is half of duty. But to serve humanity is the other half. People of France, let us throw away our weapons and this meaningless slaughter and focus on improving the lives of the common man. If the elites want their war, they can fight it themselves. For us, faisons la guerre à la guerre. Let's do war against war. On the eve of 1919, France sits on the edge of collapse. With her armies folding to mutinies and desertion, many analysts fear a single blow may end the war for good. And then, the Germans launch their spring offensive. In March of 1919, the German spring offensive smashes through French lines at saint miel encircling Verdun, and reaches as far as Nancy. Despite an Allied counterattack, Amiens falls by the end of the month and a wedge is driven between the French and British armies. As communication and supply lines are cut, all pretense of joint leadership ceases and the British begin a fighting retreat to the sea. French forces watch in terror as their British allies turn their heels and make a run for the coast, where they may be transferred safely to the British Isles. France is now truly alone. The framework of wartime patriotism and propaganda, which for years bridged the nation's long-standing divisions, begins to collapse. Prominent leftist organizations like the SFIO, France's Socialist Party, openly call for an end to the war and are soon echoed by radical groups within France's largest union, the CGT. They are met in Parliament by furious accusations of treachery and defeatism, but to no avail. Massive strikes attempt to stop the French army's desperate attempts at a counteroffensive, which breaks upon the German army, driving ever deeper into the French heartland. As a political war is waged in Paris, only a small counteroffensive at the Marne and a temporary shift of German attention to the rapidly collapsing Italian front keeps the real fighting a mere 50 kilometers from the capital. The sound of German artillery can be heard in the streets of Paris, as Clemenceau's government blamed for their defeat in the war, resigns. Soon this unrest spreads to major cities all over France. The French military, despite rapidly collapsing support on the home front, are convinced that their enemy must be equally desperate, that the German lines, so close to the capital, must represent an opponent overextended and driven to the breaking point. Clemenceau's successor, 
Gaston Dumerge, makes a frantic national radio appearance calling for one last push, one last great sacrifice. The general's last offensive begins on the 22nd of June, aiming to drive the Germans from the Parisian region in order to secure a respectable peace. French forces muster around Paris on the verge of despair in an attempt to break the overextended German lines. Historical irony would later reveal that Dumerge's gamble was not wrong. The Germans were indeed overextended and exhausted, perhaps as much as the French were, and a successful counteroffensive may have secured a white peace at this point. However, labor unrest, crushed morale, and the beginnings of a new wave of mutinies grinds the offensive to a halt after early successes. It no longer mattered why the war had started, only that it would not stop. Our thoughts turned to the great machine of war, to the ones who had built it, to those who had let it grind a whole generation to dust. What its creators had not foreseen was the machine's true product. By 1919, the war had turned us into revolutionaries. The army attempts to crack down on the mutineers once more, but it is too late. Some units are only under nominal control and refuse to budge. A nationwide general strike heralds the end of France's Third Republic. The only option now is surrender or collapse. On August 10th, after weeks of battle, strikes and mutinies, the French government, alarmed by the situation on the home front, admits the situation can't be controlled anymore and accepts an armistice. Belgium, now fully occupied, ceases to have a functional government and has no choice but to go along with the rest of the Entente. On the 12th of August 1919, the guns of the Great War finally fall silent. Negotiations for a bitter peace drag on. With winter approaching, the Treaty of Versailles is officially signed on November 6th. Representatives of the French, British, Portuguese, Belgian, Luxembourgish, and German nations sign a peace heavily favoring Germany. French radical pro-war proponents, now humbled twice by Germany, see their worst nightmares come to bear. France is pressured to sign the humiliating treaty by Britain, who feared the Republic would end up collapsing on itself and, in turn, weaken the United Kingdom. German diplomats make clever use of France's wartime debt position and offer to buy French colonies rather than demanding them outright. The French government agrees to sell off her African and Asian colonies for the entirety of her reparations, effectively cancelling any further costs to the peace. France, desperate as unrest grows even in the colonies, agrees to sell. Parts of metropolitan France are also lost to Germany. The Prié Basin, Longwy, and the western slope of the Vosges are occupied by the Kaiser. These territorial losses are comparatively small, but many are furious. The citadel of Belfort, symbol of French resistance in the War of 1870, is now under the control of the German Empire. This disgrace would leave deep scars in the French national pride and slowly fester into an all-consuming desire to crush Germany for once and for all. France's humiliation is made even deeper as her colonial empire and overseas possessions are carved up. All of Central Africa and Indochina is handed over to Germany, as well as France's Chinese holdings and the Moroccan protectorate. Germany also demands a demilitarization of the Nancy region and a destruction of French forts on the Belgian and German borders. French soldiers are forced to destroy the fortifications of Verdun, where they held the Germans in a bloody stalemate for years. In the end, all the death and destruction was for naught. In this moment of national crisis, a hatred is lit in the hearts of the French people, against the German occupiers, certainly, but also against her faltering government, incapable of winning the war and too proud to end it, selling France to the highest bidder as soon as their positions were threatened by the anger of the masses. Standing on those hills, made with the corpses of our brothers, we swore expensive oaths. We would tear down the incompetence of the Republican government and create a better France to face this dark future. The crimes and humiliation brought upon us by the Bush would never be forgiven. Their endless murder would never be forgotten. There would come a day of reckoning, where France retook what was rightfully hers and put Germany to the torch for her arrogance and imperial ambition. 
That day would come, but first, we had to turn our attention to Paris. To remove the old government and to allow for new ideas to rise. More than a century ago, France was defeated by the Germans, and from her ashes rose a new republic that brought the Germans to her knees. We believed that once again, our people must rise up, just as our forefathers did in 1789 and in 1871. We believed in a new revolution. In this new age, we would force France to live up to her motto of equality, liberty, and brotherhood. Or perhaps, go further. Resentment against the French government slowly boils to a fever pitch over the second half of 1919. The hated Treaty of Versailles brought an enormous economic downturn to France. Most of her colonial empire has now fallen into German hands, and the coal-rich northern region was either devastated or occupied by Germany. Even after the war, hunger continues to ravage the beaten nation. In this growing chaos, several political leaders appear on the forefront to voice France's resentment against her government. In massive rallies and speeches, they bash against the Treaty of Versailles, and the archaic structures of governance and position that many say caused France's defeat. In this revolutionary atmosphere, several important factions rise up. The most significant development here is the reformation of France's largest workers' union, the CGT, or Confédération Générale du Travail. In 1919, this union is taken over by its syndicalist wing, called the CSR, or the Comité Syndicaliste Révolutionnaire. These radical syndicate socialists tap Pierre Monat as general secretary. Unlike the reformists that dominated the unions during the war, Monat is an uncompromising revolutionary and calls for the establishment of a workers' state. He is met in the political arena by an old ally. Secretly, Monat begins talks with the Socialist Party of France, the so-called SFIO, or Section Française d'Internationale Ouvrière. This party, founded by the legendary Jean Jaure, had taken a staunch pacifist stance in 1918, doing much to push for an end to the Great War. Perhaps less radical than the leadership of the CGT, the SFIO can still count on millions of voters across France and forms an important voice for socialism among the people. The CGT and the SFIO quickly see that their interests align and work together during these troubled years to form a united leftist front. At the other side of Europe, Observers from these French revolutionaries see the failure of the Leninist Russian Revolution, where the Bolshevik front is now rapidly crumbling due to infighting. Distancing themselves from this failed communist theory, the new French United Left decides to fight for another type of socialism. This political union of workers' syndicates and socialist parties in France is soon given a new name, syndicalism. For this syndicalist front, the revolution will not be led by a vanguard but by the masses. Organized locally in councils and unions and supported by a broad front of proletarian organizations, the syndicalist state will not be left at the whims of a sole party, but will be organized democratically, with the representatives recallable, and the economy in the hands of unions, reminiscent of the Commune of Paris of 1871. At this point, it is obvious that the camarades of the CGT and the SFIO don't fully see eye to eye about the exact organization of this state, but for now, their burning desire to overthrow the bourgeois order is more than enough to keep France's revolutionary forces united. Across the border, these events are watched closely by Germany. The Kaiser, ever looking for ways to weaken his opponents and strengthen Germany's grip over Europe, begins funding the French syndicalists in secret. It is a move he would later come to regret. Bolstered by mysterious foreign benefactors, the CGT and SFIO form a united front and attempt a first takeover of the government by forcing the Republican Parliament to her knees with a protracted general strike. Their unifying rally call becomes Tout ça pour rien, or All This for Nothing. The strikes would fail, but the outrage generated by the Treaty of Versailles rallies the protesters, joined by many who had once been far from revolutionary hopes. As soon as the German army leaves northern France, Lille and most of the coal belt rise up in open revolt and refuse the French Republican army entry into the region. The protests rally around the humiliating treaty, spreading across the nation at breakneck speed, and the situation becomes rapidly untenable for Republican forces. 
By November the 12th, mutineering soldiers and syndicalist strikers throw up barricades in northeastern Paris. Armed police and military units are sent in, escalating the situation into insurrection and finally, revolution. On November the 20th, protesters and soldiers storm the parliament. The rebels proclaim the creation of the revolutionary commune of Paris. They raise a scarlet banner over the capital and the government flees to Versailles. The news reaches the rest of the nation the day after. Hearing the call of the Paris Commune, workers and protesters from Lille organize to seize the city. After a short but fierce fight, the strikers succeed in entering the site of the town hall and the prefecture and proclaim the creation of the revolutionary Commune of Lille. Inspired by the revolutions in Lille and Paris, other nearby communes follow swiftly. By the start of 1920, French communal forces start skirmishes with the French Republican army all over France. Revolutionary communes are created in Lille, Limoges, and Marseille, while the Department of Var in southern France also turns red. These militias, revolutionary fighting forces of the communes, are formed of convinced socialists, adventurers, and veterans of war. Such armed bands will be the forebearer of the revolution going from town to town to spread socialist ideals and convince the people that the Republican government is lost. By February that year, the loyalist Dumerge government, now seated in Orléans, launches a large offensive against the growing Red Menace, hoping to retake the capital from the Commune of Paris and thus deal a major blow to the revolution. The Commune of Paris slowly begins taking over nearby communes to prepare for this attack, forming an organized militia to meet the government in open battle. Militia forces and the government clash at Lina, a key junction in the main road to Paris. Militia forces ambush the government by flanking them from Romboulet and the passages near Senar, and government forces are crushed. The victory at Lina is celebrated in Paris as a symbol of the inevitable victory of the revolution. Paris has taken the initiative and declares her intent to create a federation of the communes of France later that year. Pressured by revolutionary attacks, the other communes join Paris to create a unified executive board. It will take until the fateful date of May 1st, 1920, however, to officially ratify the so-called Federation of the Communes of France. The new government declares itself the successor of the French Third Republic. She is colloquially referred to as the Commune of France. Camarades, brother, friends, stand with me now as we light a torch that will cast light upon the whole world. Bear witness to a new form of state, a not just form of governance. France belongs to her people now, a France for and by the worker. Hear me, workers of the world. From the blazing light of France to the capitals of the world, we submit this to you now. You have nothing to lose but your chains. The government that claims control over you is corrupt, weak, and frightened by our revolution. They will try to shield the truth from you and tell you that we are radicals, revolutionaries, dangerous rabble. But the blood in your veins, as does mine, runs deepest red. You know this in your heart. That the only path to salvation is throwing off the yoke of the capitalist, the pope, and the autocrat. That those who feed you lies do so only to keep you complacent. Complacent because they fear you, workers of the world. For they are few, and we are billions. I implore you, workers of London, of Berlin, of Rome, of the whole world, take up arms against your unlawful repression. Camarades, break your chains. By the end of March, communard forces push past the forests of Rambouillet and into the Republican heartland. The north of France is consolidated, and other offensives confidently chip away at the Republic's territory. 
A final push toward Orléans spells doom for the Republican government's capital. The government, parliament, and high command decide to evacuate to Nantes in the west of France. As the government flees west, the resulting chaos and lack of orders means many army regiments and mid-level officers decide to surrender or defect to the syndicalist cause. By the time the government arrives at their new capital, they learn that most of the country has already fallen to red forces. By this point, Dumerge's panicking government realizes the war is lost and commands Field Marshals Pétain and Foch to help escort the military and remaining loyalists across the Mediterranean. The government hopes to continue the fight from Algeria, where many loyalist pied noirs have managed to fend off all traces of leftist agitation. Pétain and Foch debate this plan fiercely, agitating for continuing the war in the mainland against what they consider traitorous rabble. But they're overturned. The government sails south, where they will remain until the end of the war. This motley collection of loyalist armed forces and old government institutions would form the basis of a government in exile that would challenge the Commune of France's legitimacy over metropolitan France. This new republican government was shaky at best and would later collapse under tensions between the Pied Noir colonists and exiles. The instability would lead to a military takeover under Philippe Pétain in 1926, turning the republican rump state into a thinly veiled military junta. These troubled remnants would later be referred to as National France. Whatever loyalists remain in mainland France are now trapped. Many army elements see the writing on the wall and begin surrendering. For communard forces, it is now simply a matter of conquering loyalist holdouts one by one. The last bastion of the loyalists, Nantes, falls at the end of summer on September 29th. France is now fully under the control of the commune. Celebrations break out when the news reaches Paris. In a fit of revolutionary fervor, young radicals set the Sacré-Cœur Basilica on fire that evening. As the church blazes into the night like a massive bonfire, crowds gather around the collapsing structure as a symbol of the destruction of the old order and a herald of what is to come. These radicals proclaim that never again the workers will be insulted and a new socialist building will be erected where the church once stood. While the communard government later condemns this vandalism, at least officially, few in the city seem to be bothered by this wanton destruction. On June the 7th, 1920, the Commune of France manages to secure a peace for the border conflict between her and Germany. The Commune government promises to respect the territorial changes of the Treaty of Versailles and is recognized in return by the German Empire as the legitimate French state. Germany is contented by this revolution, thinking her former rival France has now fully collapsed into anarchy and will never recover to challenge Germany again. The German Empire hastily signs the treaties, distracted in Eastern Europe and Africa with conflicts resulting from her rapid absorption of colonies. Only two years after crushing defeat in the Weltkrieg, France appears young and energetic, set against the victorious but groaning German Empire. In those years, France's defiant revolution spreads across Europe. Berlin watches with trepidation as Italy is torn between republican and syndicalist factions, and Britain expels the royal family, declaring a syndicalist union of Britain. In Germany's new overseas territories, chaos and pandemonium spread as Germany struggles to control her bloating and expanding empire, while still recovering from the Great War herself. This new age would bring peace for Germany, but a tenuous one. Over the years, revanchist factions would claim dominion over her western syndicalist neighbors. This effectively put an end to Germany's hopes for a peaceful process of European integration under her rule. Before long, France and Britain would begin rearming and breaking the force limit clauses of the Treaties of Versailles. In 1926, France and Britain host the Fifth Congress of the Third Internationale. There, they announce the formation of a military alliance between the two syndicalist powers, promising a new world alliance of the workers to oppose the German Empire. Germany, from her side, was forced to cobble together what allies she could carve out of her contested territories with Russia. These young Eastern European states, led by German princes and nobles, would form a faction called Mittel Europa, uniting the monarchies of Europe in a bid to stand against the revolutionary theory of syndicalism. 
To complicate matters further, old remnants of the Entente remained in rump states and governments in exile around the world. They too eyed their old territory with hungry eyes, and still had many loyal followers on the mainland. By the beginning of the 1930s, new battle lines were being drawn in Europe and in the hearts of populations worldwide. The World Revolution began spreading to America, Russia, Asia, and further yet. Once more, soldiers manned fortified borders between Germany and France, cannons pointed in all directions. The old grievances of the Great War were never settled and were now enhanced with revolutionary fervor against the idea of empire and monarchy. Slowly, the Internationale and Mittel Europa began preparing for another all-out war, with the Entente biding its time. Germany, so confident in her last victory, had grown uncertain. Her growth and ambition were taking a toll on the empire, and rumblings of an American syndicalist revolution sparked threats of a massive syndicalist superpower rising across the Atlantic. The war would begin with cloak and dagger, as Germany attempted to subvert and secure political allies in conflicts all around the globe. Everywhere, the groaning masses of laborers were rallied into revolution. Even at home, German trade unions were inspired into strikes and subversions of the Kaiser's power. Seeing these troubles in Europe, the German elites trembled. To secure her future in the world, Germany would have to face a new breed of enemy. A red dawn over Europe to be continued. Wait, they're listening with the audio on. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the Kaiser Katz and Mark crew proudly welcomes you to the world's first art history webshop. We are a collective of artists, actors, and musicians who make art history content on YouTube. All of our original work can be bought through the webshop and every sale helps us create more free content. And with that, we have reached the end of our much-requested Commune of France episode. Our next episode will focus on Russia and the reformation of Eastern Europe under German control. Kaiserkat Cinema is a collective of artists, actors, writers and musicians on a quest to bring the world free alt history content set in the rich universe of Kaiserreich. If you would like to design and print your own alt history flag, check out our spin off project, Flag Maker and Print. All right, guys, we are back and we are moving on to the QA. Just give me a minute to set up here. The one thing that's very harrowing when you're streaming is the, the scene switching because I'm not exactly sure in what order I need to enable or disable audio tracks. Patrons and crew, can you guys sound off? I think I have system audio. Howdy, uh, patron and crew. Uh, okay, it looks like we have correct audio set up. Now, uh, I would need the manual, the autofocus of my camera to sort of find me. And that's kind of a problem with this camera is that it doesn't... Okay, I think that we have it. Excellent. So we are joined by the Kaiserreich French Rework team uh, and some developers from the Kaiserreich Front. We have just seen the Kaiserreich documentary episode 2 as directed by Marcus Jurgensen, as you are hearing here. So uh, Marcus, thank you for this wonderful, wonderful episode. Yeah, it's, uh, it's always been fun looking uh, and working on these things. It's it's, uh, mm. it's fun, yeah. It's great. I think um, the series specifically is what we are doing to create that full introduction to the Kaiserreich uh, like universe and war. That is the main like the main concept that we have for, for this. Basically, eight episodes I have been talking in chat, explaining... Uh, just a second... Uh, so Julie Master asks, any chance that you will sell your flags on Amazon? Uh, this is possible. I have I've looked into Amazon a while back. It's not something I've pursued then, but I may pursue it later this year. There's a few other things that I want to do. Uh, first off, I prefer that you use our Shopify platform rather than Amazon because Amazon takes quite a large cut from their vendor. So basically, once you're in the Amazon system, you have a lot less freedom than you do have with Shopify, for example. Uh, for those of you wondering. There is indeed a 
uh, sale going on at kaisercatcinema.com. I just uh, published a large update. So there's a bunch of new stuff. Uh, a lot of you were asking for Patagonia Workers Front flags, uh, this and that. And you can get the new US posters for which we will be doing a giveaway. For that, I will need to check my DMs. Let's see. Nijato. You sent me... Yes. Okay. The first question for the poster giveaway. So let's start with the Garda West Pacific States poster, which I will be giving one free copy of to whoever answers this question first and correct. But I will post a question on our Discord. So I will not be said here on live stream. So I will post that question on our Discord in five minutes. So make sure that you join our Discord if you have not already. Let me give you guys a link. In the description. Uh, Nijaro, are you in the stream? I'm ready to start uh, answering some questions if you are. So Gaming with Regret asks, is there going to be a video about Oceania? Uh, yes, uh, I have not exactly... I think that's actually going to be the like an, a seventh episode, which would make the US episode one later. So basically I think one on Oceania and uh, South America is basically the only thing we haven't planned into, into an episode list right now. Which means we will land either on 8 or 9 episodes, depending on how much content we have. For this France episode, we did debate for a while to split it up into two because it became so long. Um, I think we should try to go between like 20 30 minutes. This is 40, which is, you know, kind of pushing it. Uh, Sarah Louise asks, Will the Commune of France have a Soviet communism path? Uh, generally, I think no. I'm not aware of what the French rework team is doing, but that's never been a thing with Kaiserreich as uh, syndicalism is the main left ideology. How is my day going? That is an interesting question. Uh, it's been a very frantic week due to various uh, health-related concerns, family-related concerns. Uh, other than that, we are doing well. Uh, excited to be finally present this episode. We spent a lot of time working on it. So we're very glad to have it out. It will be premiered to the world on uh, Wednesday, of course. It is not the Kaiserreich Discord, for those asking, it will be the Kaiserreich Cinema Discord. In the general discussion channel, I will post a question, let's say, in five minutes. Uh, Nijato, can you come on the chat live stream uh, in the Patreon and Cool Lounge so we can answer these questions? Oh, uh, drop it at the end. He's, got, he's here, but he can't talk on his microphone, it seems, apparently. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, well, well, let's go. Will the Kaiserreich devs add sub ideologies to the mod at some point in the future? I cannot answer that question, unfortunately. The mainstream. Uh, you can. Okay, so uh, Neil cannot talk with the microphone on because he is in. Um, he's basically in a room with a bunch of people, so there's a lot of background audio. In which case, uh, Nijato, I will read the questions to you. And can you send them to me in text in the patron and crew chat? We'll, uh, yeah, that's fine. We'll, uh, we'll send those to you. So, uh, there's one. Will the Kaiser Reich devs add sub ideologies to the mod at some point in the future? So that's an Oscar Johnson question. Uh, Roman Didelet asks, does it mean that Monat takes fourth place as starting leader? Uh, Omar, now this is one that I can answer. Uh, Omar asks, at the rate that we are producing, when do you think the documentary will be finished? At the rate that we are producing, I mean, let's say two months to an episode, nine episodes. So that would be 18 months if, uh, if we continue that math. Obviously, there's a little more going on there because I have been considering to basically uh, do something like the last quarter of the year. I don't really want to do any other content. I was thinking of like calling it like we're going into silent running like all we would do is finish the divided states episodes because there's a lot of work that needs to be done and i do want that episode done by the end of the year so i'm going on holiday soon when i get back that will be the thing so i am starting to get some answers from neil ferrandis first posting the question on the uh, kaiser Cat cinema general discussion channel eh, looks like john jack reed made a really cool uh, really cool cine poster all right, I love this uh, John. He basically isolated the chevron emblem. I'll pull it up for you guys. So this is uh, what John Jack Reed just posted on Discord. 
So, uh, Desert Frey asks, when will the Russian... So this is the flag that John Jack Reed made. When will the uh, Russian episode release? So Russian episode will be episode 4, which is the next one to release. And then it will be episode 5, which will talk about central powers. And which means Ottoman Empire, Austria-Hungary, you know, Osk like all that stuff. Uh, as well as the Near, the Near East. And then Germany, of course. Posting the question on the Kaiser Reich. Kaiser Get Cinema Discord. Now. I will pin it in case uh, chat moves too fast. The first person to answer this question in email, that's very important, to send me an email. <laughs> and yeah. you need to know what my email is, you need to know where to find it. It's not not that hard. I that's the question not. on my email. That's a two in one then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The question itself and what is what is Vincent yeah. Zimola? So there's people posting the answer on Discord right now, which is not very clever because the person that knows my email can actually read that and be like, oh yeah, oh, oh. looks like all those messages were just deleted. Mm. Uh, that was funny. I just saw like five answers and everyone was like, yeah, we got it, we got it. And then they all delete their message. On my email, that is the correct place to win a Guard of West Pacific States poster. Incidentally, spent 100 hours painting this one. I hate how it looks. <laughs> I think you did a really good job with the poster. Uh, I think I think it's I I expect more of it. You know, I was like, oh yeah, it's gonna be so cool. It'll have this, you know, like oh, the boot's gonna be there. Oh, I was talking to my girlfriend like over uh, over breakfast, like yeah, it's gonna be like a boot, and this guy's like he's on a mountain. It's gonna be so extreme. And then now I realize that like if you look at the guy behind him, like it just makes no sense. Like they're just walking on this really like not very steep incline. There's just something wrong with like the way these characters are spaced in in, in, in like the environment, basically. And it's it's like once you once you see it, you it's like cannot be unseen. It's super oh. annoying. We can, we can definitely tell that you're not a you're not a Pacific States. You're a traitor. I mean, who final democracy? I, I do I do love the Pacific States. I think uh, I I play Union State mostly, but uh, I do like that idea. I did design that Pacific flag, by the way. It's the only faction flag that I've like specifically designed that I think is popular. Let me see if my stuff on my email. Is uh, so Marcus, while we're here, can you answer like talk a little bit about what you did with the footage? Like how did you get it like nicely colorized like that? Uh, the footage sourcing for the episode of uh, for the France episode was a complicated one that involved looking through digital archives and libraries. Uh, mm -hmm. One, for example, be the University of uh, South Carolina. That's it. Thank you, University of South Carolina. Your library, their digital library, is extensive, and most a lot of our footage comes from uh, comes from there. Uh, the problem with getting old footage black and white is that there's something called a variable frame rate. Now, in simple terms, you see those videos of people hand-cranking uh, cameras? Yeah. When they panic, they, hand they crank it faster. When they're calm, it's slowly, right? Okay. So, throughout a footage, the footage speeds up and down. We have to try to make it normal, normalize it, so it's like a consistent yeah. speed, yeah. And require lots of time remapping and making new states, interpolation as it's called. You, uh, you actually did that manually, the time remaps? Uh, for some of the footage that were important, okay. we did that. But for some others, it, we, we added enough frames that it looks smooth enough. You know? Yeah, it does, look, it does look quite smooth. I also love like the new blue tint that a lot of footage has. So that's something that we're looking more into, like color grading. Yeah, we're yeah. using uh, AI deep learning to try and colorize our footage. It isn't like a perfect, uh, yeah. like a handheld, not handheld, but like a handmade colorized but it does you know bring out character for for the footage <laughs> Get that. this is uh it sounds good right we're using ai we're also using ai to create the divided states fairly limited but okay well, technically that's correct right we have uh we're, yeah. tr we're trying things like style transfer like 3d there's a lot of blender stuff it's like a bunch of bunch of a bunch of robots morty it's very cookie <laughs> from watching rick and morty um so some of the maps you're seeing 
on my screen right now. Those are Rusky business maps. Uh, I will put that one on the on the uh, web shop as well. Once I have some time in the coming week, I've been very busy this week, just preparing stuff. You know, we have Treaty of Versailles map. We have a really cool, you know, uh, world territorial changes after the Veldt Creek map. So basically showing some of the smaller ter territorial changes within Kaiserreich. And uh, what we do then is basically we invert them. So we do channel invert. So these nice bright white maps become like really black maps. And then I drop in really heavy color, like, you know, that. Belgian red, you know, German black, France blue, and then we hit it with a lot of effects in After Effects, so everything has this sort of really grainy feel to it, and I think it's like a really cool style that we've had for this documentary, and your footage really fits that. Yep, it's been, uh, it's been fun working on this episode. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Gaming with Regret asks, is the idea of the exiled British government invasion? Yes, this is 100% uh, possible that the exiled British government does retake the homeland. We have a comic series on the matter. If you search for Kaisergat Cinema Project Reclamation, you will find some of the comic book tests we did for that. So basically, if you go to World of Kaiserreich uh, Canada or British Loyalists, that's also based, based on the idea of the Canadian basically British exiles in Canada retaking the home isles with support from uh, Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, and royalist segments within the homeland in, you know, 45, 46, like a little later, somewhere in the, like going into the Cold War years is one of the major events there. Uh, that is not official Kaiserreich canon, of course. There is no Kaiserreich canon after 1936, but what we do at Kaiserreich Cinema is we basically build different timelines and what you guys should do if you like our content is definitely go check out our radio, which is one hour long form audio content designed by our very own Alex Dunk, who is the radio voice that you hear on all of our trailers, all of our stuff. He plays Nicholas Faircrest essentially in our universe, which, who is a like a Canadian British radio presenter. And he, basically every episode is set in a different timeline. So something else happened. There's a red, you know, syndicalist take over the world timeline. There's a dark timeline with Salvin Kov bunch of really interesting stuff happens and it's not a very popular series i still love doing it i would love to do to do more audio podcasts and i'm constantly plugging that stuff in every live stream please go watch that audio content it's so cool uh, royalist uh, radio royalist radio you know just just go to guys get cinema click videos you know uh, tab all that stuff you want to you want to watch all of it it's it's amazing it's wonderful <laughs> Uh, let's see what we have. So we have a bunch of questions. And... <laughs> uh, Minute Man with the Savage. Uh, he says, my main critique, this is a patron, he says, my main critique of the episode is inventing an entire country for the episode doesn't really fit. It would be cool if France existed in real life as well. Such Absolutely huh. savage. Brilliant. Uh, yes, Otto von Yitzmark did get the Red Dawn reference, which is always in there. I think Red Dawn will be called um, Kaiserpunk from now on. Uh, for those wondering what Kaiserpunk is, it's basically so whenever I um, I want to chill out, I do this. I draw like steampunk uh, Kaiserreich mechs and I, I model them as well. And I want to make a figurine of them. And there's uh, there's an April Fool's video with Kaiserreich Red Dawn, where it's like Kaiserreich, but everything like steampunk and Warhammer-like, because I really love that Warhammer vibe. And that's what we do. Uh, has no relation to anything we're doing, no relation to Kaiserreich timeline. It's just like an in-joke with like really cool mechanized infantry. E yes, getting back to those questions. Will the Kaiserreich developers add sub ideologies to the mod at some point in the future? So uh, Neil did answer no, they have been considered already, but they are considered a rabbit hole of pointless details with no added benefits. Romain Dillet asks, does it mean that Monat takes Fauré's place as starting leader? Uh, Nijato says, Monat is clearly the dominating figure in 1919, but he does not last all the way to 1936. We already sent some teasers on the KR Reddit that shows the starting leader in 1936. And it is uh, Jean Zyromsky. Uh, let's see what we have. Is there going to be a revolution? Paolo Barrontini asks, will there be a, revol uh, a video specifically about Italy? I don't think we will talk about Italy specifically. Uh, I'll, because basically it's covered in this episode, and it, but it's covered fairly briefly. Because I don't want to do three episodes on syndicalist revolutions. I think that this episode very covers the idea very well that, you know, it's just um, 
world revolution. It may be a thing if we have time to talk about like, you know, other parts of the world and then just bundle everything that we've forgotten in previous episode, put it in this one. So this is one Panzerkampfwagen asks what happened to popular German com communists like Luxembourg and Liebknecht. So that's a Nijalo question. Let me send that in there. Otto would buy the figurine. Uh, well, Otto, first, uh, first we are making it for ourselves. <laughs> uh, so we, I've always wanted I, to put a figurine on uh, on my desk that I've designed myself. Uh, Chilino asked question: When's the next episode for Knights in Shanghai? And um, uh, we have we have a man with exquisite taste in the live chat, of course. <laughs> Yeah, we can also tie that in the future with a short on Italy, because it's it's a lot it's a lot less production, you know, yeah. to I make mean, uh, to make a make that audio form. So Knights in Shanghai is a Flame Fang's project. It's Gabriel's project. I've asked him when he wants to do a sequel. He's very busy right now. I'm not sure when he has time. Uh, maybe if he's watching a live stream. I know he's not in the crew chat. Uh, but he's always like, uh, if he wants to do a script. Now, if you want to lead that project, Marcus, you know, just hit up Flamefang and say like, hey, uh, you know, if, if you want me to take this over, that's okay. Oh, uh, uh, this is Flamefang's love child on Knights in Shanghai. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do a spinoff. We'll do Knights in, you know, Turin or something. Yeah. Actually, an idea that I had today, well, I was thinking about your short film. Oh. Um, to basically turn that into an animatic. Uh, the way we do the divided states by taking stills from the footage and then redubbing it with Kaiserreich content because mm -hmm. I'm doing budgets right now and I was thinking we could fund it but it's not looking good like it's not looking like we'll have any money uh, besides like the bare necessities unfortunately um, but maybe we could you know take a minor credit and then take those stills and turn them into some some content for us and then just you know dub new voice lines over them well, uh, we, uh, I still have a, a budget, and it, mm. we could always talk about this and, and have some more yeah, you know, yeah. content. Well, I, still, I love that script, so uh, for those who don't know, Marcus is also a film director. He has a short script for a historical film uh, centered around a German soldier uh, who steps on a landmine, basically gets stuck in that position because he cannot leave all that thing. Very, very cool script. We. We are considering on taking a minor production credit on it. The problem with live action is that our budgets are so crunched right now. And uh, that we've already cancelled, well not cancelled, delayed Strive 2. Uh, and replaced it with shorter, shorter form content which re revolves more around studio shooting. Because it's something that we can handle more than large live action projects. So I don't want to fund another project. Uh, unless like we suddenly come into a lot of money, which is why I'm hoping for the sponsorship deal uh, and the July 4 sale to go very well. Uh, so to basically, well, we totally segued out of control there, but um, to answer that question, Omar, uh, there is no immediate plan for Knights in Shanghai 2. We do want to do one, uh, so it depends on Flame Fang. That's who, the person you will need to uh, bug for that. Let's see, has nobody sent me the answer? My goodness, my... Your email is, is, is Enigma itself. It's not that hard, it's on the website. Let me check, it is on the website, right? Are you sent the right email? <laughs> Uh, yeah. You ha you do have like five emails for Kaiser. Right? Yeah, I do have. I have like a bunch of emails. Uh, there is. Yeah, there is. There is. It is in the contact and about page. I mean, yes. Let me help people a little bit. This has never happened. I think nobody is. Uh, so this is where the thing goes, and then the question is indeed on general discussion in the pins. This is my Kaiser Cat Cinema email, by the way, guys. If you're like uh, doxing me to find my personal email, that's not gonna work for you. Gaspar Bavier, sorry, wrote. There will be a documentary about Russia. Yes, the next documentary will be about Russia. All the Russias, not all the Russias, but. Well, we will we will call the episode all the Russians. That's a little nod to Sarmatia, you know, the old school guys uh, over there. I had a like an interview with them recently. Mm. If you want to, if you guys want to see about the original founder of of the Kaiserreich mod, we uh, did an episode, two episodes about him, uh, called uh, "What Is Kaiserreich?" A mod and universe documentary. I'm actually thinking of making another uh, thing like "What Is Kaiserreich?" Explained simply. Uh, I feel like we're doing this a lot, but <laughs> it's like so just a one. 
Yeah, it's a one minute video with like a cartoon style and it's like just us saying, hey, you want to learn about Kaiserreich, but you have no time to watch an eight hour documentary. We got that. This is how it works. You know, and then we just, you know, we break it down really simple because you can, I mean, there's, you can explain it in one minute. If, if, like, we need to make it good. cute, you know, chibis. Yeah. yeah, that's basically what I was thinking. We, I don't think we've used the chibi style enough on this channel. Uh, I feel like people do not fully comprehend that this is a weep channel. And if you are not a weep, you should not subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> it's, and we gotta, we gotta gatekeep this harder. Uh, start every episode with like uh, w starting uh, watching anime together live streams. You gotta love it. You gotta love it. Uh, Oscar Johnson asked, "Will the Kaiserreich devs also add super events as well?" I am actually not sure. I need to put past that. Bye. Oh yeah, yeah, patron. I will kind of mute himself. This is a this is a group chat. Yeah. Bring I, forth I, the Patreons. Who does not make a group? <laughs> Bring forth. Muted, so I thought. Okay. <laughs> Let me run that. Uh, Do you guys see that? I got that like a nice little patron trailer uh, done. So it's this one. Um, so what we have here is uh, basically like just a breakdown of our uh, patrons doing cameo appearances in our divided states, the upcoming animated feature we are making so as you can see they just take cameo spots within all these scenes so here's uh that's called a shell and oh man oh that's kingfish 58 kingfish 58 taking pilot position on that uh, fancy new uh, german horseman bomber uh me we custom designed for the episode that is isaac d committing financial uh bad things at the beginning of an episode that's luna walter on that billboard uh, here's a bunch of people running away in Denver. Uh, Marcus, that's actually you in the bottom right as well. Angry Ooh. Beaver in the front. Uh, forgot who's in the back. Ah, Jewel Belly, of course. So basically, I think it's a fun thing to have us all. If you go look at this uh, scene with um, with Reed right now, you'll actually see that all these background people are also patrons. So it's like, it's Bam Colt. There's like six people in there. Love it. Uh, Ash the Kraken asks, will we explore the Far East such as the Qing and Japan? Marcus, that's maybe a you question. Uh, you are, I, I'm pushing you as you are the director now. You answer these questions. Oh, oh okay. Yes. Um, well, since we had the major rework for China last year with Flame Flang, there is a lot of content like new in China that not a lot of people have touched upon before. So there's always this fresh stuff there to definitely look at. Uh, I would love to do it more in the future. Yeah. Uh, stuff in the Far East, considering I am a man from the Far East. Yeah, that, actually, so I'm, that was not what I meant. <laughs> what I meant, I was like, you're the director of this. <laughs> but uh, you are you are from Vietnam. You want to talk a little bit about like uh, what's Indochina? You were born? Indochina. I, I'm, I was born in uh, Indochina, right? Modern day Vietnam. Hmm. Um, and actually, some of the some footage, I, I snuck in some of the Indochina footage into, in the France episode. Yeah, it's really Yeah. Cool. French Foreign Legions going through Vietnam uh, and Ho Chi Minh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What, uh, it's it's what, what stuff. What part of Vietnam are you from? I am from the south, from uh, from Ho Chi Minh. Okay, yes. Ho Chi Minh City, that's cool. We, um, so Helene, uh, my girlfriend, she's been bugging me to visit Southeast Asia because she, she watches these food uh, documentaries and they, they were like about the food cultures of Vietnam, Cambodia, for example. A friend of mine has visited Thailand, Cambodia. And she was like, oh, we got to visit, you know. Uh, then COVID happened, of course. And that's all, you know, <laughs> been delayed by quite some time, I would say. <laughs> oh, Iron Nation attacked. Uh, so, Iron the Kaiserreich developers do say about super events that there are no plans to add super events. Uh, why there's too much performance cost to it. So uh, that is... Redux does have super events. Uh, yeah, but as you know, Kaiserreich does already run into performance issues and they want to, and apparently Super Events does, uh, does add a bit of like extra processor overhead. They don't want to, don't want to come on that. Just a minute, I need to pull my render up again. So no Super Events for the foreseeable future. Uh, so Nijato is answering, why is Wutsavwa a part of Switzerland in Kaiserreich? Comrade Zim says, never, never the super events. Love it, love it, love it. 
Uh, so I have a winner on the uh, Pacific States poster giveaway. The Pacific States poster will go to uh, Brian Kian, who emailed me as the Walrus Man. So you were the first one to email me. Brian, I am going to send you an email back. Congrats, you are the first one to answer. Crack Enigma. Correctly, correct Enigma, Enigma code. Uh, let me get back to you after the live stream because I'm on live. It's kind of hard to answer these questions right now. It'll be funny if you go to your email and Brian has sent you like to every single one of your emails, you know? Uh, that has not happened. It's uh, actually one person sent to my personal email, which is not. Um, it is the guy that gets into my email that you need to send to. Okay, second one. Uh, I will post it. Uh, it is so there's um, two streets from Downing Street. There's a red letter box. There is a note taped on. <laughs> <laughs> we should do that, like an alternate reality game. Uh, it's just an ARG where we have to. Like, yeah, yeah, we'll go. We're just gonna <laughs> go full in with this thing. Uh, just a minute, I need to test that. <laughs> so. Uh, the Down with the Traders, Up with the Stars poster this uh, question I will simply post publicly because Nijato hasn't shared that this is an exceptional, exceptionally difficult question. Can you quote at least one member of the SFIO who became a minister in the government of the Union Sacré during World War I? <laughs> I cannot answer this question by the way, there is no, there is no. Yeah, there's just no way. That, that is a very difficult question. That is that is a very difficult question. But yeah, I, I love that. So the first, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna hide my email for this one. The first person uh, to email the answer to pcat.cinema at gmail.com wins a US poster. That will be our second giveaway. So, who... Can you quote at least one member? At least, like, do they do they get more posters if they quote several? <laughs> yeah, I know. There's uh, there's just bound to be like a political theorist uh, from the Sorbonne tree uh, in our in our in our chat who is like, ah, of course, I have a, I have a doctorate in this <laughs> very subject. <laughs> You'd be surprised, at, like, the level of people uh, who obviously were all interested in history who have like like actual like massive degrees in history and have like studied extremely niche aspects of history. Um, a good friend of mine, he wrote his master thesis on uh, essentially the partition of church uh, farms in Eastern Africa after decolonization. It was a very interesting piece because there's a lot in there. There's like, you know, the role of the church in the colonial state, the corruption, um, you know, the burgeoning democracy and also how European nations basically in many cases did not perform decolonization properly allowing for stable states to form in that post-colonial era and that's basically all from you know he, he's also he's all viewing that from the way that the church divided those lands obviously there were many factors but uh the church was definitely like one of the culprits in this in this in this case all right so obviously blood leaving us uh, i will end the live stream in 10 minutes or so when we have the second question because I do have to get up early and uh, we've had quite a good run. Obviously in blood, see you man. We'll be taking a few more questions until we leave. Is there going to be any more of the Divided States series? Yes, of course, M. Thompson. We are making a 26 episode animated series of it absolutely uh, this is our big one right divided states project.com and uh, everyone who is here i do want you to surf to the divided states project.com check out our stuff you know live action projects really cool short film we did a bunch of stills but what you need to do is go down here and sign up to the mailing list email at email.com and then you will receive my newsletter, which I send out monthly, which has, you know, stuff we're working on. All newest projects. Of course, a lot of divided states. Uh, I made this website myself. I'm quite proud of it. It's, uh, I use, like, one of those free page builders. Uh, it's not it's not Wix. It's like, we're not being sponsored or anything. It's just, like, something we got. You use go. Skillshare. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, come on, hit us up, Skillshare. Uh, Can you DM me the resource you used for that? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I'll tell you. It's, um, uh, just a minute, I need to think. Um, 
It's Divi. Divi is the name of the side builder we use. So basically my... Uh, basically my... Um, my web hoster, he has a good subscription to Divi and he... So we're not being paid for this, Divi, you know? Maybe hit us up. Uh, he, he, he says like, you know, if you, if you take like three websites off me, I can get you like a Divi subscription as part of that. So, um, there we go. Um, let's see what that answer is. Okay, there's three answers here. Okay. Let's see if anyone got it correctly. No, no, no. No, that is not correct. Keep putting, people. And that is not correct. See if people, uh, it's possible that people cannot crack this one. Can you? There, it is more. There's at least one. <laughs> mm. Let me put that up screen so people know what that uh, what that question is. Can you quote at least one member of the SFIO who became? There we go. Uh, post the swell thing. There we go. Even for Get over there. Oh, so sorry. Go on. <laughs> nope. All right. All right. Cool. Game River, get ask. Kaiser can about how many concepts have you used? There seems to be a couple of German jet, German concepts like the jets. Uh, that's a sort of like a research question we had, and um, uh, AUS commander is here. Uh, AUS on our research team is here. That is correct. We also have Kamrad uh, Zim here who could answer that question as well. I think. Yeah, we have a few researchers in the chat in our Patreon. They might not oh. be available on microphone ah. though. They're shy, yeah, but they're shy. there there I mean. is a lot of uh, German concepts of, like of what if Germany kept you know one World War Two and they we see designs of like crazy tanks and weird guns and in 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 the divided states you know we we have that the Germans use this uh, yeah a weird machine gun. <laughs> Machine I'm Gavea. actually uh, I'm actually thinking of toning down the alt history tech slightly. Uh, I, so in the trailer, it does seem like it's a big part of that series. It's not essentially a big part of it, but it's you know some shots we put in there. I was talking to my uh, my cousin uh, just this evening, a few hours ago, and uh, he's in animation and he saw that trailer and he's really good at basic trailer editing. He works for big feature films. And he was like, yeah, Vincent, you're putting... There's just too much stuff in this trailer, you know, and you need to, like, put less stuff in your trailers. Uh, I have no idea what's going on, like, who's... To someone who doesn't know Kaiserreich, this is a very confusing trailer. There's just a bunch of... They don't know what, what's happening. So, I have a concept for a new trailer, uh, which will focus more on the events in Episode 1 specifically. And uh, we'll talk a bit about that as well, Marcus. As I get back from holidays, it's going to be all divided states. Uh, we I want to get that thing finished, and I think we can. So we'll talk a bit more about editing, audio, all that stuff. Pedal to the metal. Yeah, of course. Let's see. Aha, uh -huh, we have another answer. I think this is also incorrect. So Brian Q1, that is incorrect. Monkey Man, also incorrect. Let's make sure I get it. I do need a list for this. No, also incorrect. Uh, Neil, they might not be able to answer this question. You might, we might have overshot the mark here. This question's too hard. They're uh, not so all researchers. Lightning Shadow, and this is a Neil question. Uh, I didn't notice. Are there any plans to expand content and background for communar involvement in Algeria specifically? I'll uh, post that in the Patreon group chat. Let's see. Uh, and the Oscar Johnson question. Yeah, okay, no. Haute Savoie. Ah, yes. Uh, the Gaspar Bavier question. Why is Haute Savoie a part of Switzerland in Kaiserreich? Haute Savoie is occupied by Switzerland during the French Civil War because of a clause in the Treaty of Vienna of 1815, which makes it a neutral place. Of course, this is an old clause, but the Swiss moved in with anti socialist seal, and France couldn't do much about it. Uh, looks like Luna is uh, joining us as well. Howdy. Hello. No problem, Luna. Hey, Luna. No problem. Hope you are having a great Independence uh, Day. So we Vincent, will do... I'm right. I'm right here. Oh, you're here, Luna. <laughs> Howdy. I can't so... see. 
I can't see the screen, but I can hop into the voice chat. I'm on my yeah, phone. Yeah, 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 of course. Uh, so we'll do a patron exclusive live stream next weekend, probably when we'll it'll be state of the cinema. Basically, talking about financial reports, which is what I've been working on. I've already finished uh, Flag Maker and Prince, and then I should be able to finish uh, Guys Get Cinema in the coming week as well. Oh. Oh boy, those finances. Oof. Yeah, that will be a lot of fun. It's it's wonderful. You, wonderful. you may want to start for FMMP. You may want to start like finding advertisement opportunities. Yeah, yeah it's definitely something that uh, that we're working on. The so the main uh, the main thing with FMP is I don't mind uh, it losing money. It just doesn't need to lose too much money. I have a bit of a budget there. I'll don't think more. your entire life and do it. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, obviously, um, we will run out of money at some point. Uh, FMP is being run from my savings. It obviously had like a section of savings set up for investments. The initial idea there was to have, you know, a really smooth app experience and then start advertising. We've, we've actually reached that point, so I'm advertising now. There's just two uh, big bucks left, and then there's the mobile version, which is completely unfunctional. Beyond that point, I think we have a really solid flag design app, but it is, of course, fully functional. For those of you who don't know what we're talking about, we are talking about uh, Flagmaker. Oh, shit, that's my email. <laughs> no, 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 that's what I was saying. I need to, I always forget that the screen is like on live for like a, for like a 200 people. Uh, so this Flagmaker on print, this is, uh, we are currently running in Equestria at War event. Uh, actually, that will end in a few hours. It's basically, it uh, takes the thing that, you know, the flags from Kazuka Cinema, uh, but you can customize it. So basically, you know, Grab this stuff, oh, put a star in. This is now the Griffonian syndicalist state. You can group stuff. We custom built all of this. You know, we had a lot of fun. You can, you can also add in your own SVGs and PNGs and make oh, yeah. your whatever you want. Yeah, I forgot to mention. I can make a, uh, let's see, guys get cinema 20%. Uh, oh yeah, it, it does do it. Yeah, you can essentially print whatever. So. I'm printing the seal banner, which is like Ooh. a crazy amount of cross promotion. So we're we're printing a banner on Flymaker and Print to promote the seal on another web. It's all connected. It's all, it's all a bunch of tubes. You you sound like a it's crazy like a conspiracy crazy now. Conspiracy not. <laughs> it's all connected. You know, there's wires everywhere. It's all connected. Uh, I personally like the FMMP flag. Um, I really like how simple it is. So, uh, can you quote at least one member of the SFIO who became a minister in the government of Union Sokka during World War One? I'm actually thinking if I want to end the stream, but I don't think we have an. Oh wait, wait, wait! Two more. What was the question? So I can be filled in. The question is: Can you quote at least one member of the SFIO who became a minister in the government of the Union Sokka during World War One? Nope. <laughs> nope. Don't know a thing. William Waltland asks, will we have to pay or subscribe for something to watch the divided states? Nope. It'll be free on YouTube. It's always I mean that's the whole point, right? Our, yeah. So what Kaiser Get Cinema is, guys, it's a collective of artists who make free content in the alt history world of Kaiser. This is literally on every video. The way we, we make do. money, or we don't make money, we're actually just losing <laughs> money right now. But okay, let's um, <laughs> uh, existential threat aside, the way we fund our shows is by selling our art prints on the web shop is by you know uh, pushing patron uh, people get it that's basically a monthly donation that people can give us i'm thinking of smaller stuff as well like war bonds you know but the point is that we do not gate content so basically if you become a patron you do get like extra live streams you do get a weekly update there is oh yeah an early access to videos but there is no like specific content made for patrons that is not available public after a while so especially divided states uh, my dream has been to build like an animated series and then just put it online available and it's just that people you know love it so much that they're like hey you know this is so cool i'll give these guys a little bit of money and that is enough for us to keep making series in the world of guys right oh wait i think monkey man just hit it just a minute uh, no but if also if you join patreon you have a chance to join the chicago honor guard casual yes that is in place uh, in here <laughs> uh Emil, just a minute i've i've got all these answers i'm emailing them to you are you sure none of these guys are are government members of the new new Sacre? because you only gave me three answers are we gonna uh, are we not gonna like to out uh, out uh, 
outperform the, the the lore writers of this show. What if we Google it right now? Google it, and then uh, yeah. turns out they're right the whole time. Yeah, they, they, they might just be right. I'm actually I'm sending this to uh, Nijatu, French rework team. No, no, none of these guys are SFIO. So everyone who's emailing me, these are. I think this is too hard, Neil. We need to do it differently. Uh, we're going to we're going to go for the symbol the symbol of resistance question. This will be too hard. Yeah. Okay, guys. Tell the answers first, though. <laughs> what what the answers could have been? Uh, I will tell you what the answers could have been. But first, the question: Which symbol of the French resistance in 1870 was ceded to the Germans in the Treaty of Versailles? The first person to email this to me at Vincent at Kaiserkatzenma.com wins a United States poster. Okay, so that's a new question. As for the answers to the old question, uh, the correct answers were Marcel Somba, Jules Guest, or Albert Thomas. So these were all three were SFIO members who did become ministers in the Union Sacré. May, may you repeat the question one more time? The new question is, which symbol of French resistance in 1870 was ceded to the Germans in the Treaty of Versailles? Wait, oh, oh wait, no, we have, we had a, we have a, we have a problem. Guess there was in those answers, where it was. Um, I have it, but I don't want to say it. Hold up, actually, we, uh, we messed up, we actually did get a correct answer. Uh -oh. Whoa! Oh! Bum, bum, bum. Oh, come on, man. Like, the, the person uh, I, who I will call BD, um, which stands for you, you can assume things that I cannot say on YouTube. Uh, like, next time, you know, use, use a better email when you. But yes, you are the winner. BD, you are the winner. Sorry, we uh, totally read over that. So, the correct answer of the original question was Julie Gesda. This would not be an official Kaiser Cast Cinema live stream without shenanigans. Of course, you are the winner. Congrats. Oh, congratulations. Woo. Can well you done, well done, give man. me your shipping address, phone, and email for the package? Oh, well then, can I say the answer to the, to yeah, the, you can to say the new one? Answer a second. Yeah. <laughs> Free shooters. I don't know how to pronounce it in French. It's the Belfort. What? The Belfort. Belfort. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. It's basically a place where, uh, like, the French held the Germans for a very long time, and then you know, it became the symbolic, symbolic act of ceding it to Germany. If you like, the F France has seen so much humiliation in the Kaiserreich timeline; it's ridiculous. And I think it's really cool um, to play a French revanchist path, like you know, go full Cerulean, and have that final, final vengeance, and then just carve Germany up into a bunch of states. Uh, you can also select your size from the webshop so congratulations to BD and our other winner Brian, Brian. So congratulations guys you are both you Brian will win a Pacific States poster BD will win a down with the traders up with the stars poster with that I think we have reached the end of this live stream because it is getting late here at Kazakat Central uh, in the heart of Europe hidden away somewhere yeah, north of Brussels midnight now no. Uh, it's 1, 1 a.m. here. Oh, go to sleep, Vincent. <laughs> yeah, 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 we're good, we're good. Okay, um, <laughs> we've got live stream here, so for our patrons, we will uh, do a patron-exclusive live stream next weekend, which is when I will see you. I'll talk a bit more about financials and our plans for the coming quarters. Uh, Marcus, if you're available, you should hop in and talk a bit more about documentaries as well. Definitely, I'll be there. All right, awesome. So, congratulations to the entire team for this wonderful documentary episode. I think it's uh, one of the best things we've made on this channel, and it's a very solid piece. Very happy with it. And uh, that will be all, I think. Is there anything anyone wants to say before we log off for the night? Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe. <laughs> are you like Why? other people who are not liked and subscribed to this channel? Well. Oh, Join the Patreon. Is that is that like still a thing that we need to say? Like you know, press that like button back, and back the attack, ring the bell and back the attack, uh, or don't do any of that stuff. You know, head, uh, head, head to your head forward. to your local recruitment office and join the Cynicalist movement. Mm. Yes. Um, <laughs> okay, maybe not that, but. <laughs> <laughs> the cat oh, revolution. Bring down the state. Okay, guys. Um, 
we're getting silly, so it's time to log off. I want to thank you all for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed the Kaiser Reich documentary episode to France. Let me check. And I look forward to seeing you again in the future at Kaiserkat Cinema. We are on a crazy mission to create an animated series set in the world of Kaiser Reich called The Divided States, so check out thedividedstatesproject.com. Check out kaiserkatcinema.com. We sell original art prints and there is a sale going on right now. Thank you all for everything, and I will see you for the next one, cats. Vincent out. Kaiser Cat Cinema needs you. Back the attack. Share our content, or dash over to our alt history webshop.